Nigeria. Well, now President Bola Tinubu has asked for the suspension of the implementation of this cyber security levy. This follows several complaints from Nigerians who are still struggling with current economic realities in the country. Recall last week, the Central Bank of Nigeria ordered banks to begin the process of uh, deducting cybersecurity levies, which will be administered by the Office of the National Security Advisor. It was disclosed in a circular to different categories of banks, as well as mobile money operators, payment service providers, and others signed by the Apex Bank's Director of Payment Systems Management, Chibuzo FOB, and the Director of Financial Policy and Regulation, Haruna Mustafa. Well, joining us now from our Abuja studio is the national security expert, is the national security expert, I should say, Mohammed Mansour. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Mr. Mansour. We also have joining us from our Abuja studio still, President Global Network for Cyber Solution. He's also a member of the Cybercrime Advisory Council, Shegun Olugule. Thank you both. Uh, for joining us at this time. Here in the studio, Samomashe, a TV host, uh, also joins us. Good morning, uh, Uncle Sam. Good morning. Sam. Good morning. Good morning to you all. Uh, Mr. Sam? Good morning. Yes. Please try to explain to us why we should have a cyber security architecture. I know that this thing has been on since 2015. And most Nigerians seem to think that uh, it is a new law. Okay. Um, I, I think um, the conversation, because of the uh, cybersecurity levy, has been uh, reduced solely to a conversation about a fee or a tax being paid by, uh, by people without also examining um, why that cyber security architecture is very important and uh, integral to the overall national security of the, of the, of the nation. Now, again, I, I, I will not be holding brief for the Central Bank of Nigeria or for the Office of the National Security Advisor, but I would say that uh, to a large extent, this levy and this conversation um, are important. The, the, the levy comes into play because uh, Nigeria, again, it's, it's not a, a, a small country, it's a developing country, it's a regional power, and by default we are important on the continental and the world stage. Now, we, as a result of that, we face a lot of challenges and a lot of threats uh, from state and non-state actors. Uh, a, a part of those threats are threats that come from the cyber realm. Now, maintaining adequate cyber security, adequate cyber defense, not just for government institutions, but for other critical aspects of our country, such as the banking sector, such as uh, the, the data management systems, uh, including, for example, the National Identity Management uh, Commission. This, this is expensive. This is not, it's not cheap. It's not uh, in as much as we would like for it to be cheap, in as much as uh, we would like for it to be free. It's not free. Training cybersecurity professionals, people who would actually uh, be on the front line 24-7 protecting our institutions from, again, state and non-state uh, threats, it's not cheap. It's expensive. So I, I can see to uh, a reasonable extent why uh, this levy was included in the act from 2015. Again, a lot of people now have reduced the conversation to a conversation about 2024 and the current administration, but this is not true. The, this conversation has been in the act, this um, policy has been in the act since 2015, even as amended in 2024, and that's also important to remember. Now, uh, again, when we talk about the threats, for example, that N Nigeria faces on the cyber uh, front, a lot of people are not familiar that, for example, countries like North Korea, they have a governmental policy of using hacking uh, techniques and hacking methods to obtain money, 
to fund uh, the activities that are sanctioned by the UN. For example, their nuclear uh, weapons program, their missile program. Now, of course, they target um, large countries such as the US, uh, such as uh, the UK, France, but they, they target countries that are also easier to penetrate. For example, um, in 2021, 20, uh, there was a lot of news articles out, for example, on, on BBC, on CNN, um, about the Lazarus Group, a North Korean cyber operations unit that hacked the Central Bank of Bangladesh. Again, Bangladesh is a country in South Asia comparable to Nigeria with roughly 170 million um, people. A developing economy such as, uh, uh, like ours, a close um, GDP to ours, and yet the North Koreans um, hacked the Bangladeshis and succeeded in making a way with over a hundred million dollars from their central bank. Now, th there's no reason to, to think that uh, Nigeria is special and the North Koreans, for example, again, for example, would not target Nigeria. And in order to protect from such threats, such potential threats, uh, we, we do need trained cyber security professionals paid, um, recruited, resourced, and managed by the government, the Office of the National Security Advisor. And that, unfortunately, is not cheap. All right. Let's come on now, Mr. Mansour. We'll put you on hold and, uh, you know, let's get uh, views uh, from Mr. Shegun Lubile. Thank you for uh, joining us once again. And uh, as a member of the Cybercrime Advisory Committee, Advisory Council, now that the President has ordered the suspension of this policy and calling for a review, uh, what are your thoughts in this regard? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, just like uh, talking about the issue, uh, it has been a very controversial issue among the stakeholders. And my thought about that is that um, the cyber security levy has always been within the provisions of the Cyber Crime Act 2015. And um, it is not really an entirely new idea. And then I will also say that um, many of the stakeholders, even the industries, they have canvassed for adequate and sufficient funding for cyber security. Just like my colleague said, cyber security is an extremely expensive venture. And um, for government to be able to do that, the government is, is, is suffering from a resource restraint. There's a constraint. There's a pressure already. But this dialogue or this uh, issue has always been there. So it is not uh, something that uh, uh, maybe some group or these administrations or uh, able, uh, just came up all of a sudden and imposed the levy. But the problem is that in the, in the previous act, or let me call it the main principal act, 2015, 15. the issue has always been in the areas of applications and interpretations. Now, the issue is that, okay, if we were to have cyber security fund, how, how do we fund it? Then uh, the law imposes a levy, and it says that uh, 0 0.005, a fraction of, of that, should be charged on transactions. But the provision is not clear. What are they charging on? Are they charging on the products, on the income, or are they charging on the overall transactional values? So I think what the current uh, HAT 2024 has amended, has done, is to provide a clear, unambiguous provision. So uh, it has always been there. And the stakeholders have all, or, you know, always been looking toward how Nigerian can fund its cybersecurity interventions. I can put it to you that there are major concerns Nigeria has a problem of global reputations. As I'm talking to you, 
Nigeria has been classified as one of the fifth cybercrime sophisticated uh, country. At the time, we are even dealing with uh, four or nine issues and all that. When you look at the current um, world cybercrime hinders, you will see that Nigeria has been classified along the side of Russians, US, Romanian, what have you. But what particularly uh, a major concern to us, really, when I say to us, I'm talking about the stakeholders, is that the sophistication, the ability to carry out cyber attack in terms of access to tools, and um, the increasing motivation for the cyber criminals is really becoming daring. And so, and for Nigeria to be able to provide measure, that measure has to be funded. Let me stop here. Thank you. Right. Uh, so let me quickly ask you before we uh, take a break, and we still have the time. All right, uh, Mr. Alugule and Mr. Mansour, we'll take a break now and we'll continue with our conversation afterwards. Please stay with us. Dark marks have tried everything. Nivea Lumina 630 works from day one with visible results in just two weeks and 71% dark marks reduction in 12. Join the 1 million women already using Lumina 630 from Nivea. Thank you very much for staying with us. We've been speaking about uh, the controversies uh, surrounding the imposition of the cyber security levy uh, by the Central Bank of Nigeria. Of course, uh, you know, to bring a bit uh, more balance, the president has ordered a suspension and called for a review within two weeks. Uh, this to help in addressing the concerns that Nigerians have been raising uh, on the matter. We have been speaking with, in the last couple of minutes, national security expert Mohammed Mansour. We also have the president of the Global Network for Cyber Solution, who is also a member of the Cyber uh, Crime Advisory Council, Shegun Ulubili, with us, who have been helping to address some of these concerns. All right, Mr. Lugbile, let me start with you again, uh, as you ended up uh, on that um, particular note, which, you, you know, given the explanation you you given a, a little earlier, the president has now ordered uh, a review of this uh, cyber security, security um, um, levy. But then you said there was no clarity for it, you know, since 2015, 2018, but then 2014 conversation actually brought clarity to it. But now that the president has ordered a review, what exactly do you think will come out of this? Do we still need more clarity? Or does that mean that uh, it is now dead on arrival because the president didn't want to overburden Nigeria, as one newspaper headline puts it? OK, uh, thank you. Let me also put it across that uh, the intention of the framework of that law it is not intended to impose additional levy on the individual. If you look at the provision of that law under the second schedule, it is clearly stated the list, clearly listed the list of businesses. The focus of that levy is on business. That is transactions that are taken, that are conducted through electronics means. And then it is also expected that the business shouldn't really pass the ball to the consumer. How? The framework of that law, if you look at it, they have looked at that scenario and the impact that we have on the people. That is why you see that the CBN came up with a regulatory intervention to provide at least a coordinated and um, to safeguard certain transactions that usually have direct impact on the public or on the people, really. And then that the Mr. President uh, issue a statement 
I'm still grappling to find out if that actually comes from Mr. President. Because the law is not the creation of the Mr. President, it is the creation of the National Assembly. And I don't also know how far that the Mr. President can go to intervene in the regulatory functions of the CBN. But I also align with the idea that the levy, yeah, it would be good to have uh, an human face to the levy. But if you look at that list, the list that the CBN brought out, and those lists as entirely to a larger extent, you know, guide the, you know, the implementation of that levy. So when I see um, this morning, someone show me the Mr. President uh, has issued this and that. I went back to the reports, and usually because of my background, I try to validate the source so as to confirm if indeed Mr. President issued that directive. Because uh, I also believe that really a further engagement should be done. But I don't think that the law can just be suspended. The, uh, even the statement I read, which is not yet confirmed in my own opinion, is not suspending the law, but is seeking that there should be further stakeholders' engagement which I believe that is lacking, which is the strategic engagement of the various stakeholders across the sector. That's it. Okay. Do you guys think that there is a sense of levity among Nigerians concerning the issue of cybersecurity? Because the whole world is moving into the cyber world. Everything we do even when we want to eat, it is a cyber world. When we want to secure ourselves, when we want to dance, when we want to, to gossip, it, it's almost as though virtual world has become as important as the real world. But it seems that Nigerians don't understand that that virtual world is more fragile than the real world. And the needs, there is a need to, to, to articulate properly what the danger is in, in, uh, in, in this part of our new experience. Because even they say now that even if countries want to go to war, if U.S. wants to go to war with China tomorrow, if you don't win on the cyberspace, you lose the war. No matter how many fighter jets you are, they can all be, be, they can all be paralyzed just by pushing a button rather than just the prowess and the training of your soldiers and so on. Now, even banditry in the northwest and the northeast and parts of the country, all of that constitute an important part of our new existence. I remember that last year, or was it a year before, some states in the north said that they wanted to cut off, um, what do they call it, uh, phone connections in certain regions so that they could uh, separate the bandits from reality. But it failed because you couldn't stop them because they had control of the cyberspace. They had control of, of the internet. They had control of the web and so on. Could you please let us know the scale of this problem? And, and uh, it seems that Nigerians don't understand the scale of the threats we go through. Somebody told me yesterday that, uh, uh, last night, that he had uh, his whole account wiped off just because his card got missing in there, uh, got eaten up by the ATM. He said his whole account got wiped off and that he was still wondering what happened. Right, let, let that question be for uh, Mr. Mansour, please. Uh, we want you to address that question. Yes. And then Mr. Olugule uh, is very much welcome to uh, follow afterwards. So, uh, on, on, on the question of levity, yes, I do believe that uh, Nigerians um, take this whole cyberspace 
um, thing for granted because, again, there's not a lot of understanding among the, the ordinary people about what it actually costs to um, protect the infrastructure that powers their TikTok, their Facebook, their Instagram, their bank transactions, their WhatsApp messages, you know, and, and even secure, again, like uh, the, the other speaker said just now, their ATM cards and, 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 and things like that. Now, again, coming back to the, 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 the space of national security, uh, Nigerians also take for granted that uh, we are currently getting surrounded by uh, countries that are not as democratic as we are. They don't have uh, elections anymore, for example, in our northern neighbor, uh, Niger. And some of these countries, again, Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, are aligning themselves with the Russians. Now, whether we, we like it or not, uh, that sets us in their sights because, again, Nigeria is um, uh, inherently pro-Western. We are uh, allied with the UK. A lot of Nigerians live and study and work in the UK. A lot of Nigerians go to visit the UK. Same thing with the US, same thing with France. Now, we are well on the global stage that the Russians and the Americans, and or NATO generally, uh, currently have um, issues between them. It, it, we, we have seen the Russians use cyber weapons and, and, and cyber op op operations to disrupt their enemies. Coming back to the issue of warfare, in Ukraine, when the Russians invaded Ukraine in 2022, one of the first acts that they did was to try and knock out Ukraine's power grid, uh, Ukraine's telecommunications, using remote access um, technologies with cyber weapons. Now, our entire power grid today uh, is, is controlled not by physical people most of the time, how power is distributed from Kenji Dam, for example, or Shiroro Dam, and distributed to Lagos. It's not necessarily controlled by physical people at physical installations. There's a lot of um, virtual environments at play, a lot of cyber environments at play. And these are vulnerable. If, for example, the Nigerians, during the height of the diplomatic um, issues with them last year, if they had partnered with the Russians and said, oh, look, Nigeria uh, switched off electricity to Niger because we did a coup in our country, and the ECOWAS charter is against that kind of occurrence. If the Nigerians had partnered with the Russians and said, look, we need to send a message back to the Nigerians, they could have acted into our power grid. And we were not, or we would not have been in the position to really defend our critical infrastructure, our power grid, again, our banking sector, you know, things that affect the daily lives of the everyday Nigerian, that the everyday Nigerian does not really see, does not really take serious. They could have hacked into these things and at best disrupted them at, or at worst completely wiped them out. Now imagine a scenario where uh, the banks stop working, transfers can't be done, the ATMs can't send information to the banking servers, so you can't even withdraw money from the ATMs. Imagine a scenario where that happened and we lack the infrastructure to even diagnose the problem and fix it because we don't have the capacity in place. Now these are the, 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 the things that the framers of the Act in 2015 and even as amended in 2004 saw and said, oh, we have to find a way to um, provide the resources to the Office of the National Security Advisor to protect these critical infrastructure. You know, when, when we talk about uh, the, the cybersecurity levy, a lot of people tend to reduce it to a uh, sum of Naira and Kobo. But it's more than that. It's about building the infrastructure, training the right people, deploying the right programs to protect our critical national infrastructure. You talk about ISWAP, for example, or Boko Haram, ISWAP, again, we have seen them over the years um, trying to develop their own cyber capabilities. We have seen them um, use the virtual space to disseminate their propaganda. We have seen them try to hack into systems. Now, imagine a, a scenario where ISWAP is able to hack into the telecommunications network and MTN goes down. And MTN by itself does not have the capability to restore its network. And then they turn to the Office of the National Security Advisor, and the right people and the right systems are not in place because they were not resourced. That is a scenario of disaster. And, and that, these are things that um, the framers of the act, you know, tried to foresee and uh, uh, prevent 
by saying, okay, look, Nigeria is going through a difficult economic situation. We cannot continue to rely on oil money for absolutely everything. How do we raise money for other critical functions? Again, oil money has gone into the transportation sector, has gone into infrastructure, has gone into uh, health and education. So how do we raise money to handle other critical infrastructure, other critical national security functions, such as cyber security. How do we uh, uh, raise the, the money for that? And they created uh, this uh, cyber security fund. Now, the average Nigerian does not see that, and I'm glad that uh, we are having this conversation. Of course, there, there, there's reports that Mr. President has uh, um, um, suggested. Again, I, I think we should be mindful of the, the language. I don't think Mr. President um, ordered the Central Bank of Nigeria to suspend because uh, he, by the Constitution and the laws, he does not have the power to do so wow. as the Central Bank of Nigeria is an autonomous institution. He has suggested that this policy should be reviewed and um, a, a way to make it easier, not just on individuals, but also on businesses, uh, be found within the ambit and scope of the law as passed by the National Assembly in 2015 and amended um, in 2024. Thank you. Right. Uh, Mr. Olubule, in, in addition to what uh, Mr. Mansour has said, he has, he has painted some really scary scenarios which uh, this act, uh, the amended act, uh, seeks to correct. Uh, but, um, you know, help us to also better understand, uh, you know, during this period now of, um, you know, sensitizing Nigerians to the intents of the law, uh, help us to better understand how these funds will be well managed uh, by the office of the NSA, because there is there's also a controversy as to these amounts of money when they are accrued should actually be channeled an account and not, um, you know, for, for the uh, office of the NSA to be in charge of how these monies will, will be spent. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, what, uh, let me uh, speak from, what the, from the information available to me. Then the fact that uh, I've been part of those who developed the national cyber security policy and strategy. And that document actually has the three elements. It has the policy side, it has the strategy, uh, the strategy side, which speaks to the initiatives and all that. Then it has the implementation side. Now, within the framework of that implementation, there is, a, uh, let me stipulate, a provision for the creation of a national cyber security, you know, system. Some call it national cyber security agency or national cyber security coordination center. But however, if you look deeper, you look at the governance system at the heart of that center is built on three critical fundamental principles. The first principle is the idea that the governance of that center has to be accountable, accountability. And then the, and then the second principle speaks to the fact that there has to be a multi-stakeholder system of governance. That is where you have representative of government, industry, and the third element of society the press, what have you, the civil society. And then it, then it also speaks to the uh, you know, public-private partnership with the industry, most especially the operators. So the idea that uh, the funding will be available to ONSA and the ONSA will do whatever it, it wants to do, I don't think that is uh, the, uh, the essence and the motivation for that um, idea. If it, in fact, if you look at it now, even in the provisions of the law, it is very clearly stated, you know, the establishment of the National Cyber Crime and Racist Council. And in my own opinion, what we should do is to strengthen the function of that council, because the council provides oversight functions. In fact, it formulates policy and guide how the funding should be appropriated. So, yeah, it is understandable, and that the fear of the public is valid, most especially when you consider the past experiences and all that. 
But in this case, the NSC, or, uh, sorry, let, let me put it, the office of the NSC uh, does not really have um, such overall power and to do at its will. Then another thing is that, um, you see, we have also been seeing the effort aimed at uh, providing inclusion that is bringing industry and ensure that, um, you know, the engagement of the public is not just for the purpose of the engagement. For example, the ONSA has always been a conservative institution. They do engage with the public. But in this case, they just have to engage with the public. So that nature and that posture is changing. And that is why the framework of that implementation, which I also believe that uh, some of the, many of the stakeholders in the industry, they are part of it. They have canvassed for, uh, you know, a dedicated agency. But then that dedicated agency also has layers of monitoring and layers of, you know, uh, regulations and all that. So the office of the NSC provide the over, oversight, overall, you know, coordination to ensure that that agency appropriately, you know, implement its function. And the funding really, the cybersecurity funding, I, I'm seeing cybersecurity funding here. And it has always been part of what uh, the stakeholders has been uh, talking about. So let me uh, uh, sincerely, uh, 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 you know, speak to the fear of the public. Those, the fear is valid, but in this context, uh, I don't think that the answer has such, you know, power. And then some people came up with the idea, the, the fact that, but the office does not have uh, the power to, to uh, appropriate to itself uh, money coming from the federations and all that. That, we can discuss that later. But in terms of the governance of the funding and how the funding should be appropriated, I think there are enough mechanisms that bring into play various strategic stakeholders. I think, the, 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 let me also speak briefly to the last issue, yes, which has to do. Sorry to, sorry to jump in. Hello? Okay. Really still, apropos of what you're talking about, Mr. Lugbele, can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Right. Uh, just for you to, you know, touch on what you said, we'll, you know, we'll talk about later. I just wanted to expatiate on it because uh, the National Security Advisor already said that there is need. He actually called for the full implementation of the you know, cyber security law. And then you mentioned 0 0.5. Others are reporting 0 0.005. You help us you know, give clarity to exactly what figure is it. Because if you look at the Nigeria Interbank Settlement System, the NIBSS, you know, shows that the value of electronic transactions in the country stood at 83 trillion naira. So if you multiply that by 0.5%, which you mentioned a little earlier, it will give us 415 billion naira. And that calls for concern that ONSA or ONSA will be making that amount of money. Has it not made it a revenue generating body for the country? Okay. Uh, really, I saw the figure that people are flying here and there about the NIPSA uh, um, you know, overall um, electronic transaction for the year. But like I said, let us go back to what the CBN has done. The regulatory intervention of CBN provides a clear system list of transactions that has to be ex excluded. That is not the provision of the law, but it means that, uh, in my own opinion really, the CBN is also thinking along the line of the people. And uh, by the time you put that into context, I, I don't think that uh, it will generate so much uh, value that we're talking about. We have seen the, the idea that some people are saying, that, are, are you saying that uh, you know, 3 trillion will be available for cyber security funding and all that? I don't think so, because when you put that into context, uh, in fact, we should be uh, even be struggling to talk about uh, uh, maybe a, a few billions of that. But let me also pass across this message. Cybersecurity is not just about funding. It's about sustaining the funding. Because on the other side, in fact, I, I, it's good that you give all the insight into NIPSI. But there was a warning in the re report released by the same organization 
Nielsen warned that if the if the if the scenarios of crime increase, because from their report, I think I have it here. Permit me to just uh, you know bring it out. He said that Nigerian bank customer lost 59.93 billion between the period of uh, 2019 and 2023. Then he says that the, that the, the loss increases from 2.9 billion to, to 17.67 billion in 2023. And then that same report won us because we are getting close to intolerable events. Now, it says that that amount is lost to fraud over the past five years as a result of what? Growth of financial transaction in digital payment system. And at the conclusion of that report, it won. It, said, it says that the increase in transaction processing speed and available channels comes through unavoidable side effect that more vectors are, you know, they are getting more daring. More vectors are not available, you know, that is also, you know, motivating the fraud activities which are occasioned by the transaction on the digital platform. And that speaks something to us here. And what is it? The, the idea that um, the, 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 the funding available to cyber security, and cyber security funding has to be sustained. Continually and persistently, you have to, because the other side cyber criminal, they are getting sufficient motivations to commit crime. And then, how do you balance it? We've also had this idea that it's valid as well. Some are saying that, okay, that levy, why can't they just have a fixed charge, just like you have in stamp duty? Why can't you just have a, a tenure? Why do we have to put it on percentage? But the fact is that the, the dynamism of the digital ecosystem is increasing. It's not fixed. It's not static. The challenges are increasing. And the risk that we have been exposed to, they are increasing. So there must be a conscious effort to, you know, continually, you know, fund the national cyber security program. Let me show something to the public, because uh, there has been a question that, okay, what are they going to use the funding for and all that? And uh, well, I, I know one of the, uh, 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 the, the the positive effect of what is going on now is it is a deepening of cyber security awareness. And this is what we have been talking about for years, for years. If you look at this document, this is Nigeria National Cyber Security Policy and Strategy. If you look at the implementations here, it's not going to have, it's not NSA, it's a shared responsibility. And those responsibilities cut across the federal level, the state level, the local government level, and, you know, various, you know, institutions, funding of research and all that. There must be persistent and, and there must be continued. Another issue is here. Do we really have cyber security capability in this country? From my own experience, I have been in this industry, in this system for close to 20 years now. I can say that we don't really have. Even the few that we have, they are going out. We don't have. So one of the critical areas that this, this information is seeking to address is to develop national manpower. And to do that is costly. Cyber security is expensive. I've always been talking to people that say, cyber security is not charity. It is, it, it is expensive. It, it, Tools it, it, are involved. Research are involved. All of those things are involved. When uh -huh. you put them together, so there's a need for continuous sustainable funding. So I can understand the idea. Can I come in and can I come in and and, and um, 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 make a point quickly on on that um, figure? All right. um, you said 415 billion naira is uh, what NIBS um, calculated the, the percentage as. Um, I think if, if we, because we're talking in naira, 415 billion naira looks like a lot of money. By the time you start doing the mathematics and coming back to the dollar, which is the currency for international trade, that that. It's roughly around 300, 200 and something million 
um, US dollars. Now, when you start looking at um, the fact that a lot of banks today struggle with uh, retaining tech staff because they are all leaving the country. And they are leaving the country uh, because their skills are severely underpriced. In this country, they get better offers outside uh, the country. Now, we now come to the, this, the sector of national cyber security defense, you know, uh, cyber defense and cyber security. You, you start comparing what people who work, for example, uh, the National Security Agency in the US um, or the GCHQ in the UK or, or, or similar organizations, even in, 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 in Russia, in Poland, in, 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 in Germany and, and, and the rest, and look, the average salary for people who work for um, security and intelligence agencies dedicated to cyber security is around 200,000 US dollars per annum. That's what they earn. A thousand people, and again, a thousand people um, are, are not even enough to properly secure our critical national infrastructure, the banking system, the power grid, the healthcare system, you know, from cyber threats and cyber, and, and cyber attacks from state and non-state actors. A thousand people earning that average that is um, earned um, globally in, in institutions such as um, the National Security Agency in the US or the GCHQ in the UK, you are spending roughly $200 million. So if NIMS is calculating 415 billion naira and, and we, we, we're looking at that and going, oh, that's a lot of money. 200 million from 200 and something million, 300 million. You, you're left with very little after paying salaries to, to actually even do research and development or, or, or to actually even develop um, 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 softwares that are critical for defending this infrastructure. That's one. Then, two, look, we, we look at the fact that, again, like my, 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 my colleague said, there are not a lot of cybersecurity professionals in Nigeria, and there are literally absolutely none that are trained to the level, not the, the, the people who are trained to work in the private sector, but trained in the level of protecting government and core national um, um, cyber systems. There are basically none. We have had cases in the past where um, particular agencies or particular people have trained particular individuals to that level. But ultimately, they end up leaving because they are being underpaid in this country. Unfortunately, it's expensive, you know, uh, 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 when we reduce it to a, a, a calculation and a game of, of numbers, it's easy for us to become penny wise and pound foolish. And I think we should not we should not look at it just from the value of, of okay how much is it in naira. We should look at it also from the value of what are we actually securing. Again, you're talking trillions of naira in, in transactions just through the banking system alone. We are talking about what trillions of naira in the in the power sector alone. We are talking trillions of naira from um, NMPC and all the oil majors who have to use um, systems such as uh, Scala to manage their networks of pipelines, their networks of flow stations that have to be protected. You're talking all right. All right. maybe all hundreds right. of trillions of naira. Let me, let me butt in here. Uh, it, it looks like there's Excuse a lot me. of uh, uh, mathematical ignorance in the country. People do not know that 0 0.5 or 0.05 is the same thing as 0.005. It's all uh, half, half of 1%. And, and those people came with the number looking at the transactions in the country. They have not even figured in the fact that there are, there are exemptions. They have not calculated the exemptions and what it means. What, what will be left of the exemptions. So exactly. you know, there are always people exactly. who are around who go about with figures just because they want to throw down an idea. And so, so we are not exactly. only fighting against cyber insecurity, we are also fighting against cyber ignorance in the country. And yes, it is very important to, for us to really stress, to stress this point. We also need, we also have to I want you to, to address as briefly as you can the issue that we don't even have a cyber backbone because what we have today are, are, are what they call the islands of security. You have uh, uh, one bank having its own security system, another bank having its own security system, uh, NMPC having its own 
You have uh, the oil, oil majors having their own. You have the telecoms having their own. Yes. We don't have a backbone, an integrative system, which can even give us a sense of when something wants to come apart, we should also monitor it. Because if one, bank's pro one bank is fighting a problem, it's, 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 it's a very serious one. So we are talking about the consequence. That's one part of it. We are also talking about the consequence of these things for finance and for fraud. What was for human lives? We know that we are losing, we are losing human beings every day to, 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 to cyber, to, to, to cyber, uh, what is cyber crime, to people who move from place to place and kill people because we cannot trace them. Like what happened in Kogi recently. Yes. Now speak to this. Right. Mansour, please go first. So, we have less than four minutes uh, before we, we round off the show okay. so, so that we can get views from so Mr. Let, let to be as let me try to be as, as, as fast as I can. Now, um, again, the, the human costs of, of cybercrime by itself, not even the whole aspect of, of, of cybersecurity, is enormous. We have people that um, when their accounts are hacked, they, they, they suffer strokes and heart attacks, and, and that is the end of it. You see, you have families that lose their breadwinners um, over this and this like this. And I, I think it's, it's not too much of a cost that we, we pay something, you know, to ensure that incidents like these are, are, are prevented, and even when they happen, can easily be, 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 be fixed and rectified. In the U.S., for example, you, you, you have... Whenever there's a, a, a cyber attack on a bank or a hospital or, or, or whatever uh, institution, they can directly reach out to the FBI, you know, and the FBI Cyber Operations Department would instantly step in and provide that uh, institutional backup to help them rectify the issue before it even starts to affect the, the ordinary citizens of, of the United States. In Nigeria, I'm sorry, we, we lack that, and we lack that because we are not making the necessary investments in, in recruiting the people, training the people, developing, resourcing, and managing the systems that can actually serve as that backbone, as your colleague said earlier, you know, to ensure that our systems are protected, our families do not have to suffer when they are victims of, of, of cybercrime. We, we're all familiar with a lot of times when people are hacked or, or transactions, you know, uh, uh, disappear into thin air or they find out that they pay to a fake website or, or, or things like that. We are familiar that people start, they give up. They, they literally give up because there is really, they, they feel that there's no institution they can turn to and they have a guarantee that their money will be returned back to them. Now, if we have that cybersecurity architecture in place, yes, we have that guarantee that when incidents like this happen, they can easily be fixed and rectified and people don't have to suffer um, real life consequences because uh, things like that happen to them. Thank you. All, all right. Qu quickly now, less than a minute. I'm so sorry, Mr. Shergun Olubile, but that's all we have now, especially when you, with the assumption that this uh, move now will impact adversely on digital transactions. Okay. Uh, the impact on the transaction is really an area that we should be looking at. And uh, sincerely, I want government to look at it. Um, yeah, the CBN has provided interventions, and they how do we ensure that the businesses do not pass the effect of that to their customers? So uh, I think there should be substantial incentive to the, uh, to the business as well. Let there be at least a way to recover some of these costs and all that. And then um, I also put it across that, uh, you know, the... the, 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 the the, uh, there should be also a fair competition, you know, a, fair, a fair pricing of electronic transaction. Let it be transparent to the public. Let the public okay. have information. Uh, and then there are other alternatives. If you look at the exceptions, the exception has provided how the, uh, uh, the people, how the business can as well navigate itself to reduce the impact of that levy. Like someone said, if you, if you if you calculate the total cost of those exemptions, it has taken close to 30% of the, uh, the funding, which is not uh, bad, it's good. Then also, right. if we can have a staggered implementation of this, that will be appropriate.
All right, Chegun Lukbele and Mohamed Mansour, we thank you both uh, very much, gentlemen, uh, for your contributions on uh, this very crucial thank you. topic. Many thanks indeed. It was and a pleasure. That's thank it. You. Right. Have a great day, gentlemen. And that's it on the program. Uh, but we must warn that all the views and reactions of all our resource persons are theirs and have no connection at all with TBC News, while we also appreciate all our resource persons on the show for uh, their contributions. Thank you, Super Sam, uh, as well, for joining us on the program this Thank Monday. You. Absolutely. Absolutely.